can go ahead and get started, I think. Okay, Th thank you, Charlie. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get us going. Uh, I want to, I'm going to read because I know this is being recorded. I don't want to say anything too, uh, too, too off color or, or out of script. Um, I want to thank everyone uh, 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 to our annual board meeting. Uh, this is our hundredth and third year serving the community of Rockland County. Uh, and I know that uh, the year of 2020 has been uh, very challenging for everyone. Uh, with that in mind, I would like to take a, uh, a moment of silence for the, uh, uh, the victims of, uh, of COVID. Um, so if we could just do that for, 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 for 30 seconds, so I'll, I'll do it. So we'll starting right now, thank you. Okay, well, uh, <clears throat> just a couple of, uh, of housekeeping items. Uh, I want to remind everyone that this meeting is being recorded in compliance with the uh, New York State Open uh, Laws meetings. Um, there will be two votes tonight. Uh, and I need to remind everyone that in order for you to vote as of December uh, 9th, 2020, you must be a resident of Rockland County, at least 18 years old. Uh, I think Charlie will go over that a little bit later if we uh, exactly how we are going to vote. Yes, I'll um, take care of that. Uh, thank you, Charlie. Uh, I just want to, um, I want to thank Suzanne Barkley and the entire cooperative extension staff for their outstanding uh, uh, performance this year. Uh, when we were directed to shut down uh, all in-person operations, uh, Suzanne and her staff quickly adjusted the way uh, that we did business and adapted to a, a remote format and uh, we were able to continue to serve our community. I think uh, uh, hats off to them because they, they, really, uh, they, they really stepped up. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Chris Watkins, who's the director of the Cornell Cooperative Extension, uh, the main campus and his entire staff for their leadership and constant communication with us throughout the year. <clears throat> Again, it was a a difficult year, and their 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 leadership was very helpful in helping us guide guide us through this, uh, so that we didn't feel that we were on our own. Uh, in addition, I want to thank uh, Adam Hughes, who's our state uh, extension specialist, for his constant support. Whenever we had a question uh, that required direction from Cornell, he he was always there. We may not have gotten the answer that we wanted, but we did get get an answer. And uh, he was always uh, very uh, supportive of us. Uh, his guidance and insight are very much appreciated as we uh, move through, our, you know, making sure our organization is in compliance with uh, Cornell guidelines and also uh, the current uh, directives that are happening from the state with regard to uh, how we operate uh, this year with COVID. Um, I also want to thank my fellow board members for their service and quick action in addressing all the issues at hand. Uh, being ready, readily available to meet and discuss how we would handle the pandemic and what we needed to do to keep our organization viable and functioning. Again, uh, we, had, we have a terrific board, uh, very active and, and engaged, and they were uh, very helpful throughout, the, you know, throughout the, this whole process. I know, uh, you know, I know Suzanne and her staff were appreciative of the support that the board gave. <clears throat> I know that we're not totally out of the woods yet, but it looks like the light is at the end of the tunnel and we will get through this all together. Again, I wanna thank the, the board and, and the staff. It's also important to acknowledge the help and support that we have gotten from our local, state and federal governments. The leadership and support we get from the county executive and the county legislatures is pivotal for the survival of our organization. Uh, we never once during this, 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 this crisis felt that they had abandoned us and that their support uh, both uh, uh, for guidance on, on how to do things and also uh, from a uh, financial, uh, I think was, was outstanding. Um, the same could be said for the state of New York and the federal government. Uh, they continued their commitment to the cooperative extension at the, at the local and state level. And again, 
we're, uh, the, 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 there, there are many moving parts of this organization. And uh, I think that we uh, have kept ourselves engaged with what's happening at the state, local and federal level. And, and again, kudos to, uh, to Suzanne. Again, <clears throat> I want to thank Suzanne and her staff because uh, as we all know, they are the heart and soul of the Rockland County Cooperative Extension. I want to uh, again wish them uh, say you know thank you very much to their to their um, to their service. They've done an out, outstanding job this year. Uh, they always have, and we're we're continuing to to look forward to what exciting things they're going to bring to uh, the county again for the coming year. So that's my welcome. Uh, I think the next item uh, on the agenda is the appointment of the. Uh, the secretary, um, and I believe under the guidance that uh, I've gotten from the board. Um, oh, there we go. The agenda. I got something a little out of out of place, but I think we'll still stick with the the appointment of the secretary. Uh, uh, Jennifer uh, Sternace uh, will be handling those duties. Uh, so uh, again, uh, Jennifer, we want to thank you. I know you did that last year, and we're looking forward to your continued. Uh, um, support and service uh, in that uh, uh, as the secretary for the organization. Okay, so we, I did mention we have a couple of votes and I'm gonna sort of uh, try and get through this uh, agenda as quickly as we can so we can get to, or at least my portion of it, so we can get to the meat of it, which is you know the executive uh, director's comments and our, our program. Um, the next item on there is the, and I, this is again is a vote, is an approval of the uh, 2019 uh, annual meeting minutes. And now, uh, Charles, this might be a good time for you to, to go over how we're going to vote. Sure. Okay. So we are voting to approve the meeting minutes. All eligible voters are allowed to vote. Uh, so that is someone who is 18 as of today and a resident of Rockland County as of today and someone who qualifies as an enrollee of our organization. And basically what an enrollee is, is someone who is connected to our organization, either in our programs and our uh, communications. However, uh, the legal definitions right there from our uh our articles, but basically, if you're on this call, you're pretty much an enrollee. That, that, just the basics of it. So I'm going to launch a little poll, and there are going to be two questions. The first one is just affirming that you are a qualified voter, and then the second question will be to approve or not approve the minutes. So if everyone could please take a second and fill this out. I understand that there is a correction, Paul, to the minutes before you uh, complete this. Oh, okay, could you, you tell us what that is, Suzanne? Well, uh, Anne, I understand you found something. Yes, I was just aware as I went through the minutes that there were a couple of places where you're talking about board members and they actually talked about uh, for two members of the board, they were renewing their two-year term as opposed to the three-year term. And one of them <clears throat> one of them was for Bernadette Connors and the other was for Paul. Okay. It just happened to say three years, which was, in, which was supposed to be, excuse me, it said two years when it was supposed to be three. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so including that amendment, if you approve, please do fill this out. We have to have as many as we need to meet quorum. So please do fill out the poll. Okay, we'll give it just a few more seconds. Okay, so that's everybody that we have approved the minutes, so we can go ahead and move on. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, everybody, for uh, participating in that vote. Um, Suzanne, I think the, 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 the next item on this is if uh, your recognition of any uh, elected officials or you go to, to let us know who's there. Sure. So I see that Harriet Cornell, our Rockland County legislator, 
and chairwoman of the County Legislature's Environmental Committee has joined us tonight. So thank you very much, Harriet. And uh, thank you. <laughs> I don't know if uh, Annie Paul is here. Just so you know, Annie Paul is also a member of the County Legislature and she is our County Liaison on the board. So she is a voting member, but I don't think that she has joined us tonight. So with that, um, I have a few comments to make. First of all, I wanna thank you, Paul, for uh, your generous words. Um, 2020 started off on such a positive note for extension here in Rockland. We were fully staffed and our educators had developed some really great and innovative programs that we were all eager to present. And then the pandemic hit. So dumpster fire is a word that I've heard a number of people use to describe this year. Uh, and initially I thought that was a little harsh, but now with the arrival of the spotted lanternfly, I'm not so sure. How did the pandemic affect us? Well, like everyone else in the state, we closed our doors at the end of March and hunkered down at home, all while continuing to work. When we returned to the office in July, we avoided in-person programming and closed our doors to the public. And actually, there were some positive outcomes of this pandemic. One is that we became the local source and distributor of masks and hand sanitizers for our few but very important local farms. And this was a really important and meaningful way for us to connect with them since we delivered PPE on three different occasions and they were all extremely appreciative. The death of George Floyd prompted numerous responses from around the country, many focused on a better understanding of our country's own racial history. And both Cornell University and Extension Administration were very, uh, have encouraged us to address this issue locally in our own associations. So what we've done here in Rockland is every week uh, staff meet for about a half an hour to look into a different topic addressing racial or social justice. And I do believe that in the process, we've all learned uh, a new part of our history uh, virtually every week. Financially, like every other business uh, in the state, in the country, we have felt the impact of the shutdown. And despite our very best efforts to move essentially all of our programming online, our program revenues have declined significantly. We've learned there are limits uh, to the number of Zoom meetings people will attend, even if they're at home in their pajamas. However, and most importantly, our financial support from the County of Rockland did not decline. It has not wavered. And in fact, we are level funded for 2021. We are very grateful for that. I'm convinced it's due to the dedication and creativity of our staff. So you'll hear from our educators shortly, but I wanna just take a moment to acknowledge our administrative staff. So you met Jennifer Stryanisi, our administrative assistant. Janine Rose is on, she is our financial coordinator. Charlie Payne, I think everyone knows, is our communications manager. And Ernesto Leon is our custodian. Each of uh, our staff members have had new demands placed on their jobs during COVID. Fortunately, with the availability of the vaccine, um, this challenging time is coming to an end. But I wanna thank our volunteers, our staff and our board for seeing us through it. All in all, we are very positive and optimistic about 2021, maybe more so now than we were before the pandemic. Uh, we have Gardner's Day, our Congress Lake Walk, Youth for Climate Action, all on the horizon. So we hope we'll see each of you in person next year at one of these programs. So now I'd like to introduce Kristen Ruggiero, who is our 4-H educator, and she will start our program with you. Hello, so my name is Kristen Ruggiero, as she said, and I am in charge of the youth development programs here. So I'm going to give a brief overview of 2020 and then I'm going to go into some three recent programs that really had an impact on our youth. So as you can see here, Teen Leadership Rockland did continue to meet in person until March, at which time we turned and went virtual. We In the beginning of the year, we also had a project sampler day. And so that was a really great event uh, during the February break. 
We also had our public speaking series and our public presentations event. The 4-H club Horses R Us continued to meet and they were able to take part in some of the virtual programs we offered and take part in some of the state events such as the 4-H project showcase. So you can see Charlotte, she has her barn door that she painted. And so through the pandemic, the club also uh, participated in community service activities and I was able to connect the 4-H uh, listserv, which has almost a thousand people on it, with different opportunities at the state level and also through multiple states, the different virtual programs that were being offered. So one of the programs I'm gonna be talking about is the Young Explorers Nature Hikes. So this is led by a volunteer named Jeff Solomon. And so he was a camp director and a teacher. And he really encouraged the youth to connect with nature and ask questions. And so we had five hikes from August through November. And several of the youth did continue to participate in each of the hikes. And so one of the parents reached out to me, as you can see in this quote, and she just was really um, appreciative of the opportunity because the boys really did look forward to these uh, hikes because they were meeting virtually for school and so they weren't really able to connect otherwise. So it was a really great program. The next uh, program I'm going to be talking about is the 4-H dog showmanship. Going back one, okay. All right, so the 4 H dog showmanship. Thank you, Charlie. So we've connected with Fran Hellman, who is the owner of the Four Paws Guidance Dog Training. And so she taught about 4 H and AKC showing. And they were really great skills that were transferable to just connecting and communicating with their dogs. So you could really see the growth from the beginning of this, this five session series to the end. And the youth definitely had more confidence. And you could see that the dogs were really listening more to the youth at the end. And so finally, the last program I'll talk about is the Virtual 4-H Veterinary Science Program. So this is normally an in-person program. We've been doing it for, I think, over 30 years now. And so we obviously went to a virtual format this year, but it gave us the opportunity to reach youth outside of Rockland County. So we had 19 youth from Rockland, but we had 48 participants in all. So we even had two from Puerto Rico who had joined this program. So it was really great to connect youth with different experiences, but with similar interests together. And uh, we were even able to connect with the uh, veterinarians outside of Rockland County. So you can see the fish farming for food production here. That was uh, led by Dr. Helene Marquis from Cornell University. So we were able to get high level professionals for this program. And it was just a great opportunity uh, for the youth to learn from people in the field. And at the end of the program, we had our final session on Monday and a few of the youth reached out and said, you know, I'm so glad you had this program because I haven't been able to meet with my club. A lot of the state events have been canceled. So it's just been so great to have this opportunity. Uh, and so going forward, we are continuing our team leadership Rockland virtually. We are gonna be starting the Youth for Climate Action. We are gonna be meeting with them tomorrow to start with. And we're also gonna have public speaking and public presentation programs as well. So we are looking forward to 2021. Thank you. And our next educator, uh, Kristen Osman, will be talking about horticulture. Hello, I'm Kristen Osman. I'm the horticulture resource educator and master garden coordinator at CC, CCE in Rockland. Um, so yeah, we began the year with a good start, as Suzanne was saying, and the master gardeners were going into schools for garden-based learning programs, and libraries and community centers were booking speakers bureau presentations. And this image that you see here is from February, where several of our master gardeners delivered um, very great educational information on local invasive plants and pests at the Suburban Home Show. And so this is one of our tabling events. It was you know, very successful and the Master Gardeners put a lot of work into it. And as you can see in the middle, this is kind of a sign of things to come. Um, the Master Gardeners even wore the spotted lantern fly, wore a spotted lantern fly costume to inform the public on this encroaching pest which we will be learning more about very shortly. And then with COVID and the lockdown, we had to rethink the ways we delivered our programs. And the Master Gardeners were definitely up to the task. In April, several Master Gardeners presented 
a virtual gardening education series, which was in high demand with everyone at home and with a new and heightened interest in gardening. gardening. Here you see two of our master gardeners teaching their gardening classes. We were also able to put together our annual Gardener's Day event as a virtual offering with five different topics being presented each night, culminating with our keynote speaker, the revered garden writer, Margaret Roach. These virtual programs brought in new audiences and were very well received, as you can see from this quote here. Composting education, oh sorry, next slide. <laughs> Composting education is another big part of our horticulture education program at CCE. With a grant from Rockland Green, we provide compost education to the people of Rockland County to encourage them to compost their food scraps and greatly reduce what they are putting into the waste stream. And last but not least, um, these are some of our amazing master gardeners hard at work in the CCE demo gardens. Paul Larson on the right built this wonderful fence for our native plant garden and to not only provide protection from deer and other critters that get at our you know, beautiful demo gardens, but also to create a lovely entrance to the section of the gardens. A big part of the demo gardens is the vegetable gardens where every year master gardener Donna D'Souza heads the vegetable variety trial garden. In this program, we receive seeds from Cornell and then document our experience with grow, growing particular crops throughout the season. This information is then entered into a database that can be accessed by the public interested in growing these vegetables. Even with all the challenges of 2020, it was still a great year for horticulture education. And as always, it was a great joy and honor to work with all of the amazing Rockland Master Gardeners. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike. Mike? <laughs> I'm, here. I'm here, I had to unmute myself. Hello everyone. As you know, the Horticultural li Laboratory, our primary function is to diagnose plant diseases and insects, but secondary, we also distribute a lot of fact sheets and information. Next slide, Charlie. And when we all went home with the COVID-19 chat, we had quite a bit of challenges. Uh, the biggest challenge was I spent a lot of time playing telephone tag because most clients wouldn't recognize my number. It would come up to over New Jersey. And the other difficulty I had was diagnosing plant issues and IDing insects by emailed photographs. Uh, now I'm going to show you several photographs that I received in the mail, but I also want to let you know there were equally as many good photographs, but just so you can see some of the challenges and questions. Can you tell me what kind of bug this is? What tick is this? And does it have Lyme disease? What's wrong with my pine tree? And last but not least, what's wrong with my tree? This is where I cut it. So as you guys could see, we had quite a few challenges in terms of ID and stuff not being in the lab. Next slide, Charlie. Uh, our activity was quite busy. There were numerous new gardeners uh, with an interest in self-reliance. And I got a lot of questions from new gardeners about how to, do I start a vegetable garden? What, where do I start? What do I need to do? But I also had equally as many questions from experienced gardeners that were now at home and had extra time. And they would call me and request things like a spray schedule, organic spray schedule for pears. So we handled quite a few calls and we found Monday was our heaviest days. Once the lab opened, that activity really did not slow down. The calls were just as heavy uh, and the drop-off samples began to come in, but not as heavy as a normal year because I think people didn't know we were open. Next slide. 
the success really, I have to say right now comes from our volunteers and due to their efforts, I want to thank them. By mid-May, it was obvious that the assistance of the volunteers was needed to keep things going. So they would handle all my emails, which required them mailing a flash drive amongst themselves full of flash drive, full of uh, fact sheets and other information. When we reopened, those volunteers were able to keep the same schedule and they're still helping me now in the lab. So I wanna thank everyone. And now I'll turn the program over to Jennifer Zunino Smith, who can tell us all about her stormwater programming. Thank you, Mike. I'm Jennifer Zanino Smith. I run the environmental education program here at Cornell. Uh, one of the biggest things we do here is the Stormwater Consortium of Rockland County. Um, I do want to say before we go forward with a presentation that um, nothing has stopped or even slowed down um, with COVID regarding the Stormwater Consortium of Rockland County. We help them to meet um, New York State permit requirements. We're doing. Um, we've obtained over eight hundred thousand dollars in mapping grants um, that we are working on and. We're going to cover in the next few slides. Um, so COVID, if anything, I'm even busier than ever. Um, so I, I've just, I've been very thankful. So here at CCE, a big part of the environmental education program involves running the Stormwater Consortium of Rockland County. All of the 24 towns and villages within Rockland are active members of our Stormwater Consortium. Having a countywide stormwater consortium has multiple benefits. It allows the towns and villages to obtain grants and to work together to meet New York State stormwater permit requirements. Consortium members also look to CCE to help educate the public on stormwater pollution, green infrastructure, harmful algae blooms, and more. CCE's stormwater and water quality webpage contains a large amount of information on stormwater pollution prevention as well as interactive maps. We do have multiple interactive maps. The interactive map you see on this slide was created here at CCE and contains a large amount of water quality information for Rockland County. Examples include the most impaired waterways within the county, harmful algae bloom locations, stream flow direction, and more. Accessing all this information in one location allows the consortium to view an overall picture of what is happening in Rockland's waterways. And I just wanna point something out on this map right here. You will see little arrows. We're right around Lake DeForest is, is the large lake down the center. You will see the direction of flow from the headwater, which is the start water, all the way through any water body, any lake that it travels. And then ultimately this channel of water will discharge through the Hackensack River. This layer on my interactive map is nationwide. It's not just, um, specific to Rockland. So I do want to make the um, public more aware of our interactive maps, and I certainly want to bring their attention and um, their questions to it. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, this is regarding our stormwater mapping grant. So the Stormwater Consortium has received two New York State Department of Environmental Conservation grants, totaling over $800,000. This slide shows some of the mapping we've accomplished through those grants. The purpose of the grants are to map the stormwater outfalls, which are shown exactly where, where Charlie is. Um, yes, in green, that's the stormwater outfall right there. And then in green, and then in the photo right above um, the picture. Um, the stor stormwater catch basin inlets and the stormwater conveyance system. By viewing the graphic on the left, you can see that stormwater enters the inlet, runs through the storm sewer piping system, and discharges into the nearest surface water. It is very important to know that stormwater is not treated. It's not like wastewater that is treated. Stormwater is not treated, therefore it carries many pollutants with it. As a result, our nation's surface waters are becoming increasingly impaired by stormwater. So just to take another look at the, the map on the right hand side, this is from our grant. Again, as Charlie pointed out, you have the water body right there. Uh, then you have the stormwater outfalls in green that discharge to the waterway. The red is the piping and the orange square are the inlets. So that will be what we are going to aim to do throughout the entire county. 
And we are also going to add, you'll see a little blue push pin down to the right. There you go. That's actually a green infrastructure practice. We're also mapping green infrastructure practices. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so putting it all together to improve our waters, combining our stormwater mapping efforts with our existing water quality interactive maps will allow us to see the bigger picture of what is happening with Rockland County surface water due to stormwater impacts. In this map, the orange circles represent the stormwater outfalls and the waterways shown in green are Rockland's most impaired waters. As shown, Congress Lake and Rockland Lake are impaired and typically experience harmful algae blooms each year. Analyzing the topography and stormwater discharge, discharges to impaired areas will allow us to consider retrofits and enhanced education and also furthering our grant opportunities. So last, you can visit our stormwater and water quality education webpage by going to our website as shown uh, above at rocklandcce.org then clicking on the stormwater and water quality education link at the top left of the page, and then the interactive water quality maps link uh, at the left of the page. And that will conclude my next educate, uh, my presentation. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Sonia. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sonia. I'm a nutrition educator for the SNAP Ed. I mainly cover Rockland along with Ethan, who's no longer with us. Uh, we covered that past cycle. However, I want to introduce you to our new team member, Amanda. Uh, we're so happy to have her. She's been with us shortly, uh, less than two months, so a little bit over a month. She joined on October 27th. Uh, she comes uh, with lots of information uh, and knowledge. Uh, she worked at WIC. And she also worked um, at the school, summer food pro uh, programs, uh, the backpack program, child and adult care food program. And she recently received her RD. So as you can see, we're very lucky to have her. Um, she is currently now working with us on a new initiative called the COPT, Community Obesity Program. And she will later on in a couple of minutes discuss that and deliver that presentation. So many of you probably have heard of Eat Smart New York. That was our name about uh, over a year ago. Now our program is under the SNAP-ED, which stands for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It is geared mainly for the low income individuals. Our mission is to improve the likelihood that persons eligible for SNAP will make nutritious food choices within a limited food budget and choose physically active lifestyles. SNAP-Ed is federally funded nutrition promotion and obesity prevention program coordinated by OTDA, which is the Office of Temporary Disability Assistance Program. It is administered by various um, state and local providers, such as Cornell Cooperative Extension, Department of Health, and the Food Bank of New York. Programs are delivered through activities of individual and group base, comprehensive multi-level interventions, community and public health approaches. The SNAP at Hudson Valley region covers nine counties. And our team covers Dutchess, Ulster, Orange, Putnam, Sullivan, Columbia, Westchester, Green, and Rockland County. Together we have reached 4,967 unique individuals, uh, also 226 direct programs. Prior to the pandemic and now, we have delivered all these programs virtually. The educators have been very busy um, transferring our programs into PowerPoints, and we mainly use Zoom as a platform and also Microsoft Teams. We're also part of 20 coalitions. We also have cooking demos, recorded videos, and um, some of us have continued going in person when that's allowed with six feet apart and following the CDC regulations. Next. Next slide, please. Here in this slide, you can see how we used to go in person. We cover uh, all age groups from uh, preschoolers all the way to seniors. And here I just wanted to share with you a quote, which is really nice to hear from our um, participants. This participants quoted, I went food shopping after the seminar and I spent $50 less than I usually do. 
Your tips are great. I also started chopping and prepping veggies and putting into containers for easy snacking or cooking later in the week. So thank you so much for such an informative seminar. So it's nice to hear how these uh, participants are benefiting from these programs. Some of our partners include, like I said before, Department of Health, but also school districts such as North Rockland and the East Ramapo Central. We also go to transitional homes such as Good Counsel, and we also service food pantries like in Rockland, Catholic Charities, Slowsburg Food Pantry, Touch, and People to People. Also St. Paul's and St. Anne's and senior centers. Thank you. Next slide, please. I would like you now to um, introduce you again to Amanda, who is now presently working on the initiatives of the community obesity prevention training. And this is something that we're looking forward to doing in 2021. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Sonia. Um, so I wanted to touch on the PSE aspect of SNAPBED, which is policy systems and environmental changes. Um, policy and systems refers to programs or um, stuff like wellness policies or uh, vending machine standards. Environment refers to more physical changes something as simple as uh, exercise equipment that a school might need. So um, the Community Obesity Prevention Training, COPT, is one of these PSE efforts. One of the reasons this is really vital right now is because our population is increasing. So SNAPED serves individuals who are receiving SNAP benefits or who would be eligible for SNAP benefits. So this is a low income vulnerable population. What we know about food insecurity, people who don't have enough or nutritious enough food, um, this can eventually, these trade-offs where families are, instead of being able to access fruits and vegetables and healthy meals, might have to go pick up some fast food, these low quality calories. Eventually this kind of rolls into chronic disease. So we see hypertension, obesity, diabetes in this population. So now with COVID, we kind of have a double whammy. Um, just because COVID, 94% of COVID deaths had an underlying medical condition and this kind of goes along with the food insecurity vulnerabilities. 56.6% um, of individuals who uh, died of COVID were hypertensive individuals, 41.7% were individuals with obesity and then 33.8% were individuals with diabetes. So this population is not only growing, um, Rockland County, we saw and uh, went from 2018 a 9% uh, population food insecure to 13.1. So approximately almost 29,000 people, now over 42,000 people. So this population is growing and we're going to need to continue our efforts, um, both nutrition education and uh, PSE efforts such as COPT to reach out to organizations and get them on board so we can implement these changes, whether it be in a virtual format or as we transition back to in-person education. So um, I wanna thank all the educators for your presentations. And now I'd like to introduce Richard Diaz, who is our board treasurer for his report. Richard. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, I, before I start, I just wanna say um, I think for next year's meeting, uh, can we like reverse the order a little bit and let me go before all the presentations? Because the presentations are just absolutely fantastic, seeing what, uh, what's being done. And, um, and then I come up now and I have to do this very dry kind of thing that, you know, kind of bad news. And, uh, you know, so. so for next year, my suggestion. Anyway. Let's talk about finances now. Uh, I believe we have um, a couple of slides to show. Okay, let's see what we got. Yes. Uh, can we go to the other one, Charlie? I want to do this one first. Yes. Okay. So let's talk about where we are today and, and, and what's going on. Okay. It's, it's been a tough year. No ifs, ands, or buts about that. It's been a very, very hard year. And where we're seeing 
are, you know, the, the, the biggest negative impact, okay, uh, you'll see some, uh, some lines highlighted there on our financial report. Okay, now this is not the year ending financial report. This is um, from back at the end of the, around the end of the third quarter, okay, uh, September. So what you're looking at there, when you look at the first uh, thing, you're looking at uh, the first highlighted line is uh, the state 224 funding. Now, while we have not gotten any definite word yet, we are expecting to um, experience a cut in state funding of about 20%. Now, what that does to us is that normally we would get about $59,000, well, not about, we would get $59,000 in state 224 funding. Um, with that loss, we're looking at a loss of almost $12,000. Okay, which is, you know, it's a significant loss of, of, of money coming in. Okay. Um, where else we've had uh, some issues, we've had issues with program fees, program fees, you know, we we had budgeted for program fees about $49,000 um, of income. And uh, unfortunately, we've only brought in, you know, at least through the third quarter, we brought in, you know, between sixteen and seventeen thousand dollars, and that's a, it's a significant hit because we only hit about thirty three percent of what we expected. You know, thirty three to thirty five percent is what we're, you know, what we're looking at at this point. Okay. I do want to digress for a moment and just say, this could have been a lot worse if not for the efforts of Suzanne and everyone on the staff at CCE Rockland. The work that people have put in to get programs, to make sure that grants were still coming in. Uh, it's just absolutely amazing the work that's been done this year uh, in spite of all the challenges. So this, while this number is bad, it's, you know, it's like one of those kind of things where you say, hey, yeah, it's bad. Hey, it could have been worse. No, this, this, you know, so we, we very proud of the work that everybody has done uh, to keep this, you know, to keep us going here. So let's move down to another big, um, you know, a big loss this year, special events. There was a plan to do a wonderful program at Congress Lake this year. And there was an expectation of bringing in quite a bit of money um, for that. Unfortunately, that event had to be canceled because of COVID. Uh, so there's a significant loss there, about $17,000. There is some good news though. Um, we are planning on having that event next year in April. So uh, while we couldn't do anything this year, uh, let's uh, let's keep our hope up, hopes up for, for next year. So uh, Charlie, if we can move on to uh, the next one. Yes, let's just really take a quick look at where we are on our balance sheet there. And two things I wanna point out, we have a line there that's loans payable of 113,500 plus dollars. Uh, and then there's also a long-term debt of $149,900. Now what those are, loans payable, that is the PPP loan that we applied for and uh, we, we received, that money is still carried as a loan at this point in time, because it has not been, uh, we haven't been forgiven yet. It hasn't been created, turned into a grant yet. The expectation is that the, uh, the federal government will look at any of the PPP loans uh, that were less than 150,000 to be forgiven and treated as grants. That'll be great news for us, okay? And I'm gonna just point something out after I get past that, after I just talk quickly about long-term debt. What long-term debt is, is a small business loan that we um, were eligible to take out this year. And it's a very low interest, basically a, an extremely low interest mortgage loan that we have. That money is there in the event of you know, just uh, catastrophic problems, okay? So we have that money available. We have to carry it as long-term debt, okay? It doesn't, uh, that, until we start using it, 
Okay, it's just there as long-term debt. So just to close out, I wanna go back to loans payable for just a moment. And Charlie, can you go back to the last slide just really quick? Okay, on the second page, we didn't highlight it, but if you look at the second page, um, our deficit, and there's that red number. Yep, you're right about there, Charlie. Yep, there it is, right there. That red number there, okay. Um, we're looking at the, you know, a deficit of about $38,000 right now. And I'm talking approximates only because this is third quarter we're talking here. That 38,000, it's a big number, but if we are fortunate enough and things go as we've heard they're going to go, that 113,500 plus dollars of PPP loan becomes a grant that now becomes operating funds. It gets applied against that deficit. Okay. Brings it down to about 75, I'm gonna round number, $75,000 of plus, okay? Let's not forget 224, we're looking at possibly another 20,000, I mean a 20% uh, cut in that, which means next year we're not gonna get 59,000, we're gonna get 47, eight around there or maybe less, but having this money um, available to us is going to, we're going to be able to offset those losses. Okay. Um, so as bad as things are, they're not horrible. <laughs> okay. We are, we are in a place, I'm not going to paint a rosy picture, but I'm not going to paint, uh, you know, the reality is things aren't good. It's been a tough year. It's been a tough year for a lot of us, you know, for, for a lot of people and uh, not just CCE. Um, but, um, uh, I think that we're going to be okay going forward. And uh, one more time, I want to just say, we're going to be okay going forward because, you know, a couple of things. One, we, uh, I think the board uh, that we have is very cognizant and very aware and very on top of everything that, you know, that, that we need to be on top of uh, with regards to maintaining uh, the financial health and the forward progress of CCE. Rockland and the staff we have from Suzanne to everyone else, everyone we saw, you know, we saw tonight, uh, it's incredible, have done incredible work. And I think that with that kind of commitment to, uh, to being successful, we're going to continue to be successful. So uh, that's my report for tonight. Thank you. If anybody has any questions, please say no. <laughs> And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. That was great. Okay. Um, I'll pick up the next item, uh, which is uh, the reappointment of uh, Ann Barry to the uh, to to a new term. I think uh, Robin, you were going to yes. give us a few. A little introduction on that? Yes. Uh, first of all, I just want to say good evening, but the, uh, there are no new board members to put forward for a vote today. Uh, however, we had three new board members who joined in September. So please welcome Dan Hooker, Anne Marie Pilevsky, and Jim Riley to, to the board. Um, also, I would like to welcome back uh, Dr. Bernadette Connors from sabbatical. Uh, she will start her second three-year term beginning January, 2021. And then our candidate tonight for a, a second three-year term is Dr. Ann Berry. Uh, I think you've seen her bias sketch here on the screen. And I'm gonna put forward a motion. Um, I move to present Dr. Ann Berry for election to the Board of Directors of Cornell Cooperative Extension, Rockland County for a second three-year term beginning January, 2021. And Charlie, I believe we'll be doing a vote. Yep, we're gonna do another poll. And it's just one question this time. So if everybody could please respond. I think we need a second for that vote. Do we have a board member who will second the motion? I'll second it. Okay. Richard seconds.
Okay, looks like we have a unanimous approval. Yay. Yay. And uh, I, I think it should be note to uh, Robin, wanna thank you very much. Uh, you, you've done an outstanding job uh, on the uh, nominating committee among uh, the, the many other things that you've done. So we, we wanna thank you. Um, thank you. Moving on to the, the next item is uh, I want to recognize uh, we have two outgoing uh, board members uh, tonight. Uh, we have David Aaron, who has uh, moved out of the county, and uh, Robin Efrant, who is uh, her, her term is up. Um, just wanted to say a few things about them. Uh, you know, Robin is, a, is a, a, a master garden volunteer. She regularly uh, volunteers in the Hort Lab to help visitors and collect data from our, uh, for, for program reporting purposes. She has served uh, on organizational committees, the Barn Dance, Gardener's Days, and the uh, Master Gardener uh, 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 training. She regular, regularly volunteers at the uh, St. Uh, uh, Dominic's uh, uh, Horticulture Therapeutic Program, uh, the BOCES After School uh, Garden-Based Learning, and the uh, School Garden Program at uh, Grandview Elementary School. She uh, regularly helps out with the, uh, uh, helps and organizes the uh, CCE's table at the home show. Um, as a board member, she has again, I mentioned she chairs the uh, nominating committee and has uh, brought in at least nine new members during her tenure. And I know I'm one of them and I'm very appreciative uh, of, of her effort. Uh, it's out outstanding job, I can't say enough. And Robin, I know that you'll still be hanging around, I hope with the Hort Lab and, and with the Master Gardener. So, uh, your, your, your enthusiasm and love for the uh, organization uh, uh, shows. Thank you. Uh, uh, David, as we mentioned, uh, unfortunately, uh, fortunately for him, but he's, he's moved out of the county. He's got the, he's entering a different phase of his, his life. Um, he's a prominent uh, uh, um, accountant in the, in the county. He's been very uh, influential on or guidance on some of the, the, the financial decisions that we've made. We really appreciate what he's done. Uh, I believe his first term that he started was in 2009. Uh, he was appointed as the treasurer. And again, throughout his, uh, his uh, tenure here at the organization, he has served uh, in, in, at, at different points as a treasurer, but he's always been on the financial committees. Um, in 2012 and 13, he served as the president and was also again on the, uh, as the, uh, as was on the financial committee. Um, again, he came back to the organization uh, in 2019 and he served on the financial committee until he had to step down. Although I, I believe we still, uh, he still is, uh, he's allowed to and he does uh, actively participate in the financial uh, uh, meetings, which is, he's a, he's a terrific help. His insight is, uh, is, is excellent. I uh, also wanted to mention that he also serves on the board of Bridges, which is another uh, outstanding nonprofit organization. We're gonna we're gonna miss both of them on the board, but uh, again, I know that they will stay in touch with us, which is which is uh, terrific. And uh, Suzanne, if I'm not mistaken, I think we had talked about uh, the, you you've gotten them some books as a as a gift that you're gonna mail to their home. Yes, uh, actually, when Robin comes into the lab next. Uh, we'll be presenting her with a gift from the board. Okay, yeah, it's, it's a small token, uh, but we, we certainly appreciate all the effort that uh, the both of you uh, have enhanced this organization by, by participating in it. Thank you. And with that said, um, Suzanne, I think we're gonna, you're gonna introduce the, the, uh, the, the, the program. Well, actually, I'm going to turn it over to Kristen Osman again, our court educator, who's going to uh, talk briefly about uh, the spotted lantern fly. Yeah. So the spotted lantern fly um, has been confirmed um, in this fall in Rockland County. In both Orangeburg and Slotesburg, there were small infestations. Um, there are small infestations of several live adult insects and they were discovered and removed um, at, as far as Orangeburg. I don't know Slotesburg, but I know the ones in Orangeburg, they were actively lower Hudson Prism uh, was working on removing them and coordinating with the municipalities to remove the allianthus trees that some of the egg casings were located on. 
Um, spot lanternflies are a very destructive pest that um, we've been looking out for for several years. Uh, they're really a problematic in Pennsylvania and um, we want to make sure to educate everyone on how to detect them so they can report them. And um, they, so yeah, thanks Charlie. Right here, if you were to spot them, the best thing to do is to report them. And right now with the stages that they would be in, it would just be, the adults would be, are, you know, they're not around. It would just be the eggs, the egg cases that they had left. So you would wanna look on trees. Where it was spotted in Orangeburg is right near the rail trail. So places where people will be out walking. So we wanna make sure to educate the community as much as possible so that people are out there looking so, and then reporting so that um, hopefully you know, we can be vigilant about this and report any suspected sightings and that we can slow the spread of this very destructive pest. So we have a brief video to learn a little bit more about the spotted lantern fly and afterwards we can take a few questions. video because you just came across one, a few, or maybe hundreds or thousands of this very interesting looking insect right here, the spotted lanternfly. They may be crawling around in your backyard, hanging out on your trees, or covering your deck and patio. So what's the deal with these things? Where did it come from and why are they everywhere all of a sudden? In this video I'm going to tell you all about the spotted lanternfly, the pro problems it poses, and I'll even show you a few creative ways to get rid of them. The spotted lanternfly is native to northern China, Vietnam, and Taiwan. In these regions, it is kept in check by natural predators like egg parasitoids and carnivorous insects. The United States population is believed to have come from a shipment of landscaping stone from China in 2014. The insect lays their eggs on smooth surfaces such as tree bark, branches, and even stones and rocks. And the stones that were shipped from China to Berks County in Pennsylvania apparently contained many eggs. When the following spring arrived, the eggs that were attached to the rocks hatched and out came the first spotted lanternflies in the United States. Since then, it has spread all throughout southeastern Pennsylvania and has slowly reached New Jersey, Delaware, New York, and even northern Virginia. You know those brown marmorated stink bugs you see around your house in the springtime? Yeah, those actually came from China too in 1998 and have spread from Allentown, Pennsylvania all throughout the United States. It's eerily similar to the situation that we have going on right now with the spotted lanternfly. It is very important to understand basic information about the bug if we're going to effectively combat it. So here's a bit of background. The spotted lanternfly is first and foremost a plant hopper. Plant hoppers are super interesting and come in all sorts of beautiful shapes and sizes. I mean, just look at this one. I'm like, how is that? That's amazing. Or this one. I mean, just like, is this real? But anyway, being a plant hopper means that it feeds on the sap of plants during its entire life cycle. The insect has five different life stages. The eggs survive the cold winter and hatch in the spring, and the little first instar nymphs emerge. When they first leave the eggs, they kind of look like a pale shriveled up shrimp, similar to how I looked after not leaving the house for months during quarantine. They start to feed on plants right away. In June or July, second and third instar nymphs emerge. This is a picture of a nymph molting its first instar exoskeleton, and oh, there's another pale shrimp again. Kind of scary. It's naked. Uh, are, we, are we allowed to show this? By mid-July, you'll start to notice some red color to the nymphs. This is their fourth instar, or stage of life, and the last stage before they turn into those pesky flying adults. Kind of cool if you ask me, but still just as annoying and still feeding away on your plants. Early August is usually when you'll start to notice a lot more adults. The adults now have wings, two pairs actually, outer, more dull wings with cool spots, and the much more beautiful bright red wings underneath. Despite having two pairs of wings, they absolutely suck at flying. 
they usually just hop away and flutter until they smack into a wall. This may be one of the limiting factors of the range expansion. Imagine if they could fly better, they would just have spread out much further than they are right now. In the fall, the adult females begin to lay eggs. The females have big yellow bellies and will lay their eggs in rows on smooth surfaces, sometimes covering them with a glue-like substance. You may notice these patches on your trees and they're quite easy to scrape off once they're laid. The eggs will stay here all winter unless disturbed and the next spring the life cycle will start all over. Females can lay anywhere from 30 to 50 eggs at once. Much like you have your own favorite restaurant, this insect prefers to feed on certain plants over others. In its native range, its absolute favorite restaurant, uh, I mean tree, is the Tree of Heaven or Elanthus altissima. <laughs> it's a good thing that the Tree of Heaven is native to Asia and is not found anywhere in the US. Uh, what's that? Are you serious? The Tree of Heaven is found all over the US? It's one of the most invasive plants of all time? Very harmful to native forests? Oh, okay. Yeah, well actually the Tree of Heaven is found almost everywhere in the US, so that's just... Great. It is believed by some experts that this tree is actually necessary for the insect to progress through certain life stages, although there is no scientific evidence to back that statement quite yet. But what makes the spotted lanternfly so dangerous in the United States is that it likes to feed on native species of grapevines, fruit trees, and certain hardwood trees. Over time, the trees are damaged by the lanternflies and will yield less fruit or less hardwood, which strongly impacts the economy in a negative way. It also poops. Um, a lot. Its excrement is called honeydew, and it is a sweet substance that coats anything below a plant that is being fed on. The honeydew attracts ants, yellow jackets, and mold, among other things. If you ever wanted to be showered in poo, hey, no, no judgments here, just stand under an infested tree of heaven. A 2019 report by Penn State economists found that the lanternfly costs Pennsylvania an estimated $50 million per year in lost crops and damage, as well as up to 500 lost jobs. If this insect were to spread nationwide, the cost could reach in the billions per year in damages, lost profits, eradication, and research. It has been called the worst invasive insect in almost two centuries. What makes this problem worse is that there are no natural predators to the spotted lanternfly in the US. Sure, we do have some carnivorous insects like spiders and praying mantis that will feed on them, but they don't make a dent in the vast populations of the spotted lanternfly. The bug's bright red colors and white spots usually indicate that the insect is poisonous or unpalatable, and birds and other animals have learned to avoid these coloration patterns. Even though the spotted lanternfly is not poisonous, most things avoid eating them. Hopefully some will start to catch on soon and take advantage of such a huge, abundant food source. So now that we know a little bit more about the insect and the danger it poses, the best way to combat these things is by getting rid of as many as we can around our properties and communities. The bugs have naturalized, meaning that no matter how hard we try to stomp out every last one of them, it will be impossible to completely eradicate them at this point. They have spread and established populations in our forests and green spaces and are pretty much inaccessible in some spots. However, that doesn't mean we can't slow their spread to new regions and buy scientists more time to figure out more effective ways to get rid of them. Every lanternfly you kill could prevent 30 to 100 new eggs from being laid, which is a pretty significant number. So here are some of the best ways to get rid of them. Number one, have a stomping contest. It can be kind of fun to run around and step on as many as you can find. Remember, they are plant hoppers and they can jump very quickly and very far, but they get tired after a few jumps, so be persistent and keep following them. Also, here's a tip. Instead of trying to step on them from behind, step on them from the front. They can't jump backwards, so they usually freeze and have nowhere to go. Number two, tape your trees. If you have them all over your trees, you can wrap a few pieces of sticky tape around your tree. The spotted lanternfly will climb up and down the trees a few times a day, so by taping, you can trap thousands. This is extremely effective because the bugs, especially nymphs, get stuck to the tape and will die here. You can replace the tape every few days. However, it is extremely important to cover the outside of your tape with a fine mesh or chicken wire to minimize bycatch. For example, some birds will get stuck to the tape and die as well, and we definitely don't want that to happen. So by covering the tape with wire, you can prevent this. Number three, the plastic bottle trick. This one works best for adults. 
If your tree is covered with them, simply hold a plastic bottle up to the back of them and they will jump right in. It's pretty effective and quick. What you do with them once they're inside the bottle is up to you. Number 4. A Shop Vac Now this one is incredibly fun. Simply take a shop vac and have at it on an infested tree. Number 5. Get rid of your tree of heavens. If they don't have their favorite tree around, they won't do as well. It is important to note here that the tree of heaven is a very prolific root sucker and will send up tons of new shoots if you cut down your large stump. After you cut it down, it is necessary to keep cutting back the sprouts as much as possible until the root system is exhausted. Or more simply, you can buy a root killing herbicide that will do the same. Number six, dish detergent. In a bucket, mix dish detergent with water and simply scoop the spotted lanternflies into the bucket. This works best with nymphs, I think. They will not be able to survive in the mixture. Seven, do not use a general pesticide. These are typically not super effective and will actually do more harm to the native helpful insects than to the pests. There are many negative side effects of spraying general pesticides into the environment, and there are much better ways to get rid of the spotted lanternfly. Number eight, get creative. You can use a fly zapper, you can build cool contraptions on the trees where only one entrance for the bug is available, and it leads directly into a trap. You can shoot them with a BB gun, you can take a flamethrower to them. Uh, just kidding, don't, don't do that. And lastly, I wanted to mention that if the spotted lanternfly is new to your area, or this is the first time you're seeing it, please report it to your state department of agriculture. There will be links in the description of this video on how to report. This will help scientists and state workers track the spread of the bug and help us stay ahead. Additionally, you can use citizen science apps like iNaturalist and Squisher to track its spread and have a little fun competing with friends on who can squish the most. But that's pretty much it. This will be another bug that we have to get used to. Hopefully native wildlife will soon catch on, scientists will develop unique traps, and we will be able to prevent the extensive damage that this thing is capable of unleashing. Until then, keep squishing. Well, that yeah. was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not at the squishing stage yet, thank goodness, but we there have been reported sightings, you know, or small infestations in Rockland County. So we definitely want to be on the lookout for them. The stage, as you just learned, that would be the egg masses on trees now. Um, so if you're out walking, definitely try and you know look around any the I know it's harder to ID trees in the winter but um but just try and look at the bark and see if you see anything you know any egg masses even if you're not sure and you report it you know or just take a photo and from and send it into that email that we gave you then you know, even if you're not completely sure, send it in and, you know, then they will come out and look. So, or would be able to ID from looking at the photo. But yeah, we hopefully don't want it to get to the stage that it is in Pennsylvania. And that's pretty quick, 2014, six years, you know, it's pretty quick. Any questions? <laughs> so we can't blame this one on 2020? <laughs> well, I'd show, yeah, I mean, we can't fully, but of course it did, you know, our first sightings were in 2020, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and also um, iNaturalist that he mentioned at the end is a great app that many of our master gardeners use in reporting, you know, in reporting other invasives and pests. And it's also a great tool to use if you're out um, walking in nature and you are not sure about something, you can take a photo and it will help ID it for you. Does anyone have any questions? I think we're okay to move on. Yeah, I feel like it's a very 2020 presentation. <laughs>
And spotted lanternfly. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen. Yeah. And if you have any questions, please uh, call the lab, contact us. Yeah. Or you can call, uh, was that uh, New York State Ag and Markets? Yeah, that's. Okay. It's here. Right. All right. Well, thank you very much, Kristen. Mm -hmm. And now uh, we do have a little surprise. I don't believe that Bill Madden is on. Is that correct? I don't see him, no. Okay. All right. So um, we have one last um, video to show you. And uh, this was an idea of Bill Madden, who is a board member. Uh, I'm sure many of you know, and he also uh, works at Suez. He's in charge of, I believe, uh, governmental relations. And so he offered us the use of his videographer to uh, develop a fundraising video for us, which was a very generous offer. So Charlie came up with an idea and um, laid it out, developed the whole idea. And uh, Bill's team came and uh, uh, videotaped it. So Charlie, would you like to take it away? Sure, so I will let the video do the talking since that was the whole point. Uh, so this was the special surprise in case you're waiting for something extra special after this, there's nothing, it's just this video, but you'll like it, I promise. There are times when people come into Cornell Co oh, sorry. Cooperative Extension of Rockland and start with the phrase. Oh, it's already gone. Google says, or I Googled it and. However, what they don't realize is what you read online can often be misleading, not specific to Rockland County, or flat out wrong. That's where we come in. People misinterpret the information they see on the internet. What's on the internet is not always right. You have to be very careful with your research and look at the sources that you're using. Hello, Cornell Cooperative Extension Hot Lab. Can I help you? If we can help people learn how to grow their own fruits and vegetables, or we help to ease a client's fears in terms of a deer tick or that they did not have a deer tick, we really have achieved our goals. The horticultural lab is an invaluable uh, benefit to the community. We uh, analyze samples of plants and insects to uh, identify disease and resolve problems. And we feel that we really help the community. So I love talking about our school garden programs because it's one area where all five of our major program areas overlap. We can talk to the kids not just about horticulture and agriculture and food systems, we can talk to them about nutrition and health. We can talk to them about economy. We can talk to them about the idea of budgeting. We play a little game called the Bean Game, which they love, and it helps them learn how to budget. The best thing about working with the kids in the school garden is to see how they grow from uh, kindergarten to third grade. Uh, they get exposed to the garden and when they come back, by the time they're in third grade, they're experts. We do, of course, our 4-H positive youth development with them, and it's just a great place where we can do all of these wonderful things with just one program. Unfortunately, we have not been able to be there this year because of COVID, but I'm looking forward to hopefully sometime in the next year getting back to the garden, because uh, we're gonna have a lot of work to do and seeing the kids, most important. When it's safe to go back into the schools, Cornell Cooperative Extension wants to be ready. The virus has changed how we deliver our programs and generate revenue. And we've been able to pivot and develop some really fantastic online programming. But we are going to need contributions in order to continue to adapt to the needs of the community. As Extension, it's our job to provide low to no cost program opportunities for the community of Rockland. While we get our research and resources from Cornell University, we're on our own for operations. Through the county appropriation, grants, and donations from our constituents, we support ourselves. And we're humbly asking that you support us too. Please consider donating to our annual campaign this year. And thank you for being a part of Cornell Cooperative Extension.
So I want to thank, uh, first of all, Bill Madden for making that happen, and also Charlie Payne uh, for developing it, and Robin Eifert, and Michael Wilson, and Ann Ellison all for participating in it. So I hope uh, you liked it. Um, I think it looks great. So with that, I'll turn it over to Paul. Okay, well, I want to Thank everybody for, uh, um, for, for, for participating. I think we have uh, we had at the, the high point, I think over 43 people uh, attending the meeting, which is, which is outstanding. Um, I wanna wish everybody a, a happy and healthy holiday season. And we wanna make sure we listen to our governor and we wear a mask when we go out there. Uh, as uh, that, that everyone knows, I think we're, we're, we're at the end of this, uh, hopefully at the end of this pandemic. But again, I want to wish everyone a, a happy and healthy uh, season. And uh, I'm just going to say at that point, the, uh, the meeting is officially over. Um, I was told, that, which was a good thing, that we don't need to have a vote to end this meeting tonight. So again, thanks everybody for coming. Oh, <laughs> nice. Thank you. Thank you all. Stay safe. All right. Thank you very much. I can eat now. You can eat now. Nice <laughs> job, everybody. <laughs> nice job. Excellent. Have a good night. Thank you. you Nicely done. <laughs> Excellent job, everybody. Really Excellent. fantastic. Bye bye, everybody. Good night, bye. everyone. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye.